Our sermon scripture today is from Matthew 17, 14, 20. Jesus heals a demon-possessed boy. When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon, and came out, and it came out of the boy, and he was healed at that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, Why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, Because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Thank you very much. You guys, you're dismissed to go with Miss Terry if you'd like. You can just put it right there. It's fine. Thanks, guys. Actually, I need one, too. Thanks, buddy. Tastes nothing, like <laughs> nothing like mustard, my daughter said. <laughs> if any of you are curious. When uh, you get the chance to study Scripture, sometimes you find some of those oddities of Scripture where uh, it makes it difficult to understand it. And I don't know about you, but sometimes when I read Scripture, I, I get a little frustrated because I, I don't quite understand exactly what's going on. Maybe I, I don't know the context of what the, where the story is taking place, and that's why I really enjoyed getting to go to Israel and see where these stories took place and walk on the steps that potentially Jesus walked in or be amongst the trees that Jesus was probably in. And I appreciate having those opportunities, but sometimes I read scripture and I see that there's some challenges and differences between them. Like this morning, I, I just read the scripture from, uh, from Luke, and then we heard from Matthew as well, where Jesus talks about how the faith can help you move a mulberry tree in one scripture, or it can help you move a mountain in another scripture. And I know for some people in faith, or people who are struggling with faith, or people who want to try to destroy our faith, they look at scripture and they say, do you see how this is different? Like, Clearly, clearly, the, the disciples didn't know what was going on or they got their stories and facts incorrect because there's not this thread of perfection that runs all through the Gospels and the book of, uh, the book of Acts as well about the stories of Jesus. There's some indiscriminational differences. You know, this woman's mentioned here or this town's mentioned here or you can move a mountain tree or you can move a mulberry tree. And for a lot of people, sometimes that's a big struggle because there's some there's some differences between the scripture. I, I read a, a book called the, uh, the Case for Christ once, and uh, this, this reporter did a really nice job of helping us understand why there is some differences in Scripture and why that should actually give us some solace that it is true, that it's not made up, or because of these uh, uh, errors in Scripture or recounting, that actually helps us understand that there was no collusion which over the last six, eight years, the word collusion has showed up in the news with great frequency, right? And we all go, ooh, this is going to be a bad story here for certain. But what we know is because the disciples' stories are not absolutely exact on every single detail. In fact, it means they did not gather themselves in a room and, co and collude that, hey, we need to get all the facts of our story correct. I, some of you have friends that are police officers, and my wife and I do as well. And when they talk about doing investigations, that when they meet with people in small little rooms, tiny little rooms with small little tables to give them some pressure to tell their side of the story, that frequently when people tell their stories in separate rooms, there'll be differences in the story, which tells them they didn't collude ahead of time. They didn't get together to make sure the story was 100% straight, that one person's perspective might have been a little bit different here, or somebody might have heard the story a little bit different here. Or maybe, in Scripture, maybe Jesus told this story about the mustard seed multiple times. And maybe in one time of the story, he talked about how if you had faith like a mustard seed, you could move a mountain. Or if you had faith like a mustard seed, you could move a mulberry tree into the ocean. 
I, I, there's all these differences, and sometimes that causes us to struggle. And, and there's pieces of Scripture that we all struggle with. Personally, for myself, I, I really struggle with, with, with two particular Scriptures in, in, the, in the New Testament. Number one, there's the story from Mark chapter 11, where Jesus shortly comes into Jerusalem. Uh, this is before he's going to be crucified for, for Holy Week. And Jesus curses a fig tree. I, I just really struggle with that scripture. And there's, there's a whole context and an Old Testament story that attaches to it. And I've never, never preached on Jesus uh, cursing the fig tree because it's just really hard to wrap your head around. And I've not really preached frequently about Jesus and the mustard seed because, well, I don't like mustard. So isn't that a good enough reason sometimes? That might not be a great reason, but I wanted to unpack it because I think it has to do with our prayer lives, about why it's important. And we've been taking a look at the question of why, how, and what about our prayer lives. Now, the fig tree didn't do anything, do anything right, but Jesus still interacted with the fig tree. And that, that leaves questions in my mind. What happened in that story? What, what's the deal with that? Well, we're going we're gonna to focus on the what, how, and the why about Jesus in this mustard seed. And what does this parable mean for us? Uh, many people see faith as a quantity. Do I have a, enough faith? I want more, or I feel like I have less, or we just feel like we're deficient, or maybe we feel like we're full of ourselves because we're full of faith. Well, sometimes we have to be aware of how we feel about this, and does this theologically sound about how we feel? Or maybe we just need to reframe our thought and view. And I don't know if you ever hear people talk about the word about reframe, but sometimes we put a picture frame around something that we believe, and maybe it's too small, or maybe it's focused on the wrong place. Sometimes we have to break the frame and reframe it to be able to get a new perspective. And so I invite you this morning maybe to break your frame or to reframe yourself so you might understand theologically what Jesus is trying to share here in this story about the mustard seed and our thoughts and feelings about quantity. Do I have enough? Do I have too much? Am I seeking more? And so let me try to unpack some of the context about what the disciples are asking here. So in verse 19, when the disciples came to Jesus in private, they asked, and they did this question in private. This is one of the things that we're trying to teach our girls as well, that, hey, when you have to ask a teacher in the classroom a question, hey, don't do it always in front of the class. Sometimes you want to make this a private question. And so that's why in prayer, that's why we enjoy uh, praying together as a community, but there's also value in going and praying alone, or as a small group, or as a large group. But all these variety of ways of prayer could be of importance. And so the disciples go to Jesus in private, and they ask the question, why couldn't we drive it out? Why couldn't we drive the demon out of this man? So Luke 9, chapter 9, 46 through 50, we have this scripture that helps reframe this for this. It says, an argument started amongst the disciples, as to which of them would be the greatest. You've heard this story before, right? Jesus, knowing their thoughts, took a little child and had him stand beside him. And when he had said to them, whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. For it is the one who is the least amongst you who is the greatest. Master, said John, we saw someone driving out a demon in your name, and we tried to stop him, but he's not one of us. And Jesus said, do not stop him, Jesus said, for whoever is not against you is for you. See, the disciples were stuck with a frame that was imposed on something that Jesus was trying to help deconstruct for them. For them to have a broader understanding of the relationship with God. I've been trying to impose upon you the idea that I think God is calling us to an intimate, passionate, growing relationship with God through Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world to our benefit that God wants to have this deep relationship with us. But what we see the disciples doing through three years of ministry with Jesus, frequently they're jockeying to see who has the better faith. And that's not the story that Jesus is trying to feed his disciples, but that's where the disciples are stuck with this frame. And we know that that frame gets destroyed after the crucifixion, right? After they see Jesus risen from the dead, now they really truly feel the spirit. They really feel the experience and their whole frame has been blown wide open so they can see that when Jesus talks about this faith based on love, a loving God with our hearts and strength and loving our neighbors as ourselves, they take away from the old view that they had. 
See, the disciples, they were wrapped up in jockeying for a better faith, a stronger faith, a faith that was based on following rules of the Old Testament. The faith of the Old Testament is based on 613 laws. Did you know that? The, the faith of the Old Testament, the Mosaic Law, the first five books of the Old Testament, which we call the Pentateuch, that's called Mosaic Law. And there are 613 laws involved in there. 613. 365, which represent the days of the year, right? The, the Israelites, they had an understanding of the days of the week, meaning 365. But there are 365 do-nots in the Old Testament, and there are 248 do's. So there's thou shall not and thou shalls. So there's 365 nots and 248 do's. And the 365, again, represents the days of the year that when we should take time to worship God. And the 248 was based on, that's how many bones the Israelites thought were in the body. There's by far more than that, but that's what they understood. And when they went through Scripture, they found that there are 613 laws of the Old Testament. Now, you will not find the number 613 in the Old Testament. Why? We ask that question, why? Because there's relevance to it. Why did the early church, why did the Israelites find themselves focusing on 613 laws? And if this is your first time hearing that, it doesn't surprise me. Because we spend more time talking about the relationship with God. The disciples, they were struggling to understand about the relationship with God. Instead, they thought to have that relationship with God, you had to follow the law. Follow the Torah. Follow the Old Testament. And so Jesus is trying to help his new followers, these new students of him, to understand what's going on. See, the 613 laws of the Old Testament was held by the Sanhedrin. And usually around Easter time, we start reading scripture about the Sanhedrin because that's what Jesus goes before. Jesus, when he's getting ready to be tried before he's crucified, he goes before the Sanhedrin. And who is the Sanhedrin? It's 71 religious leaders who meet at the, uh, at the temple every day, except for Sabbath, and on holidays. And on Good Friday, where we celebrate, on the time of Passover, Jesus goes before the Sanhedrin, the 71 leaders. This is an interesting story because the Sanhedrin was meeting on a holiday. The Sanhedrin doesn't meet on a holiday. But they met specifically because they wanted to meet with Jesus. And so when they decide to try to have Jesus be able to be tortured and they find him to be a heretic of God, speaking out against God, the Sanhedrin was looking at what of the 613 laws has Jesus broken? And they weren't able to say with great resolution, this is the one law that he broke, he should be punished. But they didn't like what he was doing because Jesus was focusing on this relationship with God, not following the 613 laws. And so the Sanhedrin didn't like that. Their entire faith basis for everybody who lived in Israel, who came to the temple, who called God their God, they were all focused on following the law. Can you see how that might be difficult to have a relationship with God that's only based on following the law? The disconnect that we might feel? So I know for many of you, because we understand our, our rules and regulations, and we as a country, we have the Bill of Rights, and we have all these laws that we appreciate that provide us freedoms. We, we talk about that sometimes almost equal with the Bible when we talk about the laws and scriptures of our land because of that, but they're not equal because we understand that we're called to a higher relationship with God because way beyond even what man has created over the last 250 years in terms of culture or within our religion. And so the disciples are struggling with this. We too also struggle with this. And so I don't know about you, but in our prayer lives, if we have something that's distancing us from that relationship and experience, we usually just kind of shut it down or we just feel inadequate or I don't think I'm going to be able to do it right. So I'm not going to do this at all. And so the disciples are asking Jesus a really deep and difficult question. Why couldn't we drive this demon out? We've seen you do it. We want to do it too. Do we not have enough faith? I'm going to hold up a mustard seed. You can't see it, right? Because it's so small. And actually, the seeds that you might find in Israel are even smaller than this. And so Jesus calls this smallest seed. Well, it was the smallest seed that they know in Palestine. And there are much smaller seeds that we know of today. And so when Jesus is giving this illustration about this plant that grew all across over these regions, and it kind of looked, uh, it's kind of a scrubby tree. It's more like a... Um, 
uh, honeysuckle tree, which are invasive species here in Ohio, right? They don't grow to be really large trees or that you can harvest the wood to create or build anything. You could dry out the wood and burn it like anything else. But this is a scrubby tree that would grow very quickly. And because it would grow quickly, it would grow exponentially and have a large bloom for one year, and then it would die. And its flower would shrivel up, and those seeds would scatter. They're so small and so light that they would fly into the distance. And so it was not uncommon for people to see these mustard bushes everywhere in patches, kind of like kudzu growing up in just a little patch here, and a little patch here, and would grow so quickly. But it moved quickly, and it was able to scatter and do things. This seed is not able on its own to have any power. It cannot get out of my fingers. It can't make a mulberry bush move into an ocean. But the potential within this seed is of great variety that Jesus was trying to help us. Many, many uh, modern English translations of the Bible talk about faith and the size of a mustard seed. But the Bible actually says that God's kingdom and faith are like a mustard seed or as a mustard seed, which Okay, we're going to quibble over differences here, but the size of a mustard seed is only one of its characteristics. It's not necessarily the important one, though. It's the potential within this seed. It could make mustard, which would not make me very happy, but it could make mustard, or it could continue to scatter and grow and provide home and security for birds and for other animals. The mustard plant is a fast-growing herb for us, and it was the small seed the Jewish people knew and planted, and they did plant it in their gardens as well because it would provide shade for some of the things they also grew as well. And so as the bush would grow and mature, the flowers would dry up, produce more seed, and Jesus and his disciples, they would have had some knowledge about this plant. They had context behind it. And so they would have used to, to see how this spice would be used also for their foods. They had an appreciation for the mustard seed. But the mustard seed is a striking example of, of a potential of a seed. And although it starts out small and insignificant, it quickly grows into something that blesses others. We may see it as small and insignificant, but the potential for it through Jesus Christ. And the power and potential is amazing. And sometimes we lose sight of that potential or how amazing it could be. And let's, so let's consider some things about the seeds other than how small they are. The seed does nothing until it's planted. Right now, it's all potential. Or my daughter's going to eat it here shortly, right? That, that's all we know about this seed is that my daughter's going to chew on one in a few minutes here. And that we could plant it. And so to have a mature faith, we have to plant the mustard seed, right? We have to do something with it. And so say what God does in his word here. It gives us this big choice for us to continue to dig into scripture. And I don't know about you, but like I mentioned before, I, I struggle with the scripture about Jesus cursing the fig tree, right? And you may read scripture as well. And maybe you read something you're like, I, I don't get this. Or this is obviously an example of something I probably shouldn't do. Like, there's scriptural reference about how a general's wife drove a stake through another general's forehead to kill him. This is not prescriptive, right? This is not how we're called to live our lives. But it's an example about how God's people had to go through some difficult times. There are examples in my life that were very difficult, and I was able to get through them because of the faith that I have. Is my faith large? Is it large enough? Or is my faith just large enough as it is but through the power of Jesus Christ, through the power of Jesus Christ, I'm able to endure. There are many things that we read that we just don't understand, that we really struggle with, right? There are, there are things in your life that you probably struggle with and sometimes, and sometimes they're silly and sometimes they're more complex. And sometimes when we get to scriptural ones, we're, we're just so easily akin to like skipping over it. Like, I, I, I don't know how to wrestle with this or I don't know how to, how to deal with the strength of this. Or wh wh Why would God allow this to happen? Uh, there's many of you that in this room who, who may be literalist and that's okay. And some of you might be figuratives. And I, I'll explain it to you for a moment here. Uh, but my father, who, uh, the Reverend Gary Rohde, um, my, my dad, he is a believer that in the, in the book of Genesis, the first six days literally took place. Six days. He's a literalist. I believe that God created the world in six days. On the seventh day, he rested. I, my faith's a little bit different. I, I, think it's a, I think it's a figurative story. I don't, I don't know that it necessarily actually took place in six days and on the seventh day, 
God rested. I think it's kind of one of those stories that helps us understand faith. Does that, does that my faith disqualify Genesis? Absolutely not. I, I love Genesis, and I love reading the, the early beginning stories. But my dad has a literal version, and mine's more figurative about it. But here's what I know. Jesus believed that the world was created, right? I believe it. My dad believed it. We both believe the world was created. I believe in Jesus Christ. I absolutely believe in the power of Jesus Christ. And I know that he died for me on that cross. Therefore, that's the most important thing, right? My faith is not dependent on, do I believe Genesis actually happened in six days, or my dad believing that it actually did happen in six days. But because I know that Jesus died for me and Jesus believed it, I don't have to worry about it. How about the story of Jonah? Do you believe the story of Jonah actually took place? That a fish or a whale swallowed Jonah and spit him out days later and he survived it? Is that a literal story or is it a figurative story? Here's what I know. Jesus didn't tell us about it. He wasn't worried about it. Therefore, I'm not super worried absolutely about that detail. When I put my focus on what was the detail about what Jesus was calling his disciples to do and how to live their lives, it helps us reframe our understanding about who God is. And that I may not have enough faith, or I feel like I don't have enough faith. And the truth is, we don't. I have the faith of a mustard seed. But because I believe in the one who created the mustard seed and has the potential to see it created, it helps me circumvent to know that I am never alone, that my God walks with me, and my God walks with you, that all of us have this power and understanding. And so when we go to God in prayer and we feel so inadequate, the answer is we are. We are 100% inadequate. I am not free of sin. I need a savior. And that's your story too. We are all sinners. If I asked you to raise your hand and say, if you're a sinner, all of our little patties should go up in the air. I am a sinner who needs a savior, right? And because we have a savior, he invites us to be a part of that relationship. Not to follow the 613 laws or to follow what the Sanhedrin was calling the people to do. And that Sanhedrin, that, six, that 71 group of men who basically worked like the Supreme Court of all faith in Jerusalem, they called people to follow the 613 law. And Jesus didn't say, listen, don't follow the law. He didn't say that. He said, I want you to focus on that intimate, passionate relationship with God through me. The Son, Jesus Christ, for the transformation of the world. Not just for the transformation of you, but for the transformation of the many. So this is a, a conversation starter for a lot of us in our faith as well. The, the story about Jonah, or literal figurative. And I know there are a lot of people who really struggle by that. We saw a lot of people historically really struggle about faith. Did you know that thousands of people were murdered and killed because of the faith and understanding about baptism? Should children be baptized or not? Or only adults? Thousands were killed in the name of God on the fight about baptism. Today, there's a church down the street who does things different than us. And another one that way. And another one that way. Are we at war? Are we at odds? No. We have differences. We celebrate them. We have theological differences. But we are all asked and called to be in faith with God. The age of enlightenment provided an opportunity for a lot of the world to dive, diaper, uh, dive deeper, I gotta get that straight, dive deeper into literature and read into the Bible. And that was a good thing, but one of the strange, th strange things that happened during the Age of Enlightenment is that people are trying to discern the difference between the facts of faith and the truth of faith. There's some facts that are very difficult to describe or understand. And then there's this faith-bound basis that we have that it's hard to describe. It, it really harkens to the question of why do we believe it that way? And sometimes we struggle to give it definition because it's such a heartfelt belief about how we understand things. And that's to be said about our prayer lives as well, what we're called to do. But this seed, the seed that pushes aside the rocks that grows, that uh, trees as they grow, they're able to push obstacles away. Maybe you've seen a whole wall fall over because a tree grew. Because of the potential that God sees in you and me that we can move things. Maybe I can move a mulberry tree to the ocean. Or maybe I can move a whole mountain. But that's not what God's calling us to do. It's within the possibility. And so because it's within the possibility... There's so many more possibilities in me and in you. 
The seed does not move hindrances by an explosive burst. It does it over time. And so sometimes we pray to God and ask, God, I need this instantly right now. I need another zero at the end of my bank account, right? I need healing for this. I need this person's life to be fixed just like that, lickety split. But we don't have a microwave faith. Microwave faith is not the way that we're called. It is a long game. It is like a growing mustard seed. No seed is ever affected by what all the other seeds do. They, they, they're independent of each other. And so if one seed dies, the others keep on, right? And if a seed is persistent, it never gives up. Only death will stop us from growing and working to produce fruit. And mustard seeds are new fruit. This may be the most challenging characteristic of a mustard seed. If it never gives up, it can make a difference. And the seed has the potential because God has given it. God has given each of you the potential to be in an intimate, passionate relationship with him. Through prayer is one of the most instrumental ways for us to establish that relationship. God will provide faith for us. He's already given us the mustard seed of faith. He's already done the rest of the work with us. As long as we're in that intimate relationship. And so this morning, I want to invite you this morning to enter into a prayer that many of you probably did when you were very young, or maybe you're in your youth or in your 20s, or at some time you probably gave your life to Jesus. Maybe you gave that prayer. And some people were able to say definitively, hey, I gave this prayer on this date, at this point, I was at camp, or I was at this church, or with this Sunday school leader, and that's awesome. But maybe you've never been able to give that prayer before. Or maybe you've been invited to be about that prayer. You haven't done it yet. Or maybe you would like to rededicate yourself in that prayer. This morning, I'm going to give all of us the opportunity in prayer to rededicate our life. To give ourselves to God that we might have that intimate, passionate relationship with him. Through his son, Jesus Christ. That we might see the transformation of ourselves, but also the entire world. If you haven't done this prayer, or it's been a long time since you've done this prayer, knowing that we're giving this time to God. And that you may feel like, I don't have enough faith to give this prayer to God. Well, how much faith does it take? Jesus tells us only this much. That he's willing to do the rest of the work for us to be in that relationship with him. Doesn't that sound like something we all want to take advantage of? Shouldn't we? Shouldn't we celebrate that as a church? We have a story to share with our community out loud about a God who wants their lives to be transformed for the better. Not just because we're terrible people. We're not. We are saved people because of the power of Jesus Christ. I invite you to pray with me, and then I'm going to close our prayer, and we're going to do a closing hymn. And uh, The altar is open. If you want to come up forward during our, our prayer time or, or during our singing time of our last hymn, I welcome you to come up, and then when the service is over, I'll, I'll have a short prayer with you as well. But if you, if you for the very first time, Give this prayer. I invite you to email me or, or contact me and let me know so I can be intentionally a prayer for you or tell somebody else that we can be in prayer for you as well. Or maybe this morning you're willing to make a rededication that, God, I want you to be a part of my life, that I do want to have an intimate, passionate, growing relationship with you through your son, Jesus Christ, for the transformation of the world. Not because I'm a terrible person, but because you love me so much that this would be something that you would want to reinvigorate in a life of passion, a prayer a relationship with God. Let's pray. Almighty God, we, uh, we've heard so much over the last few weeks about prayer, and sometimes we lose sight of that. But this morning, we want to take a small time, a mighty time. Sometimes this feels like a decision that should take for hours or for days for us to give our lives over to you. But this morning, we are taking just a few moments to realize that this is a process that when we enter in a relationship with you, that it's not a microwave experience that happens really quick, but it's a long game. And so when you talked about your seed and how, how it would grow and how it would make mighty differences, we know that that's a story about us. And so this morning, many of us have already done this, or maybe this is the first time, but Lord, we give our lives to you. We sacrifice we know that you've already blessed us and we ask you to bless us and we give ourselves to you in praise and knowing that you make great differences in our lives. And we may not feel that experience today or tomorrow, but we know that because this is a long game, this is a relationship with you, we pray that you're able to use us 
And we may feel like we're inadequate, but we'll remind ourselves, and as a community, we'll remind ourselves that it's because of you, our Savior Jesus Christ, who died for our sins, who took on the pain of sin, that you defeated it, that we could experience you in the here and now, and that we might do it again in the future. Thank you, God, for loving us. We want to accept you into our lives, take our lives, change us, and then what the world may see us, they may see differences in us as well, and they may judge us for it harshly, but it's because of the power of you in our lives we have so much greater things to live for. We pray that it would be your way, Lord, not our way, and that we might enter into that relationship with you in the here and now. And so for those who have given that, that prayer this morning, we ask that we would feel your Holy Spirit, that we might have that significant reminder of how much you love us. And may that fill us today and tomorrow, the days to come, that we can share that story with others. And for those of us who have already made that decision, may this be a rededication of our lives to following you. That we might put you first, to find the priorities that you've called us to do. And again, when we feel inadequate, we know that we are adequately in your love. It's in your name we pray, and all God's people said, amen.